Hello, welcome to the Shivnanda Foundation friends and family. I'm just checking that you're hearing me live. Good evening. Welcome to the Shivnada Foundation family and friends across India, maybe some parts of the world, because a lot of our alumni from the Shivnada University have also connected. Uh, this is our first event called the Shivnada Foundation Conversations. And we thought in these unprecedented, really difficult times for us uh, sitting at our homes uh, all across, locked in. Uh, let's get you uh, some of the most eminent uh, people from across to speak to us and we'll ask them um, how they're coping with what's happened and uh, about their journey and just learn from that journey. We have for you uh, as our first guest, an incredible public speaker, a corporate trainer, a life coach, uh, none other than Dhananjaya Hetarachi the world champion in public speaking, 2014 in the Toastmaster. And Dhananjaya is also a friend of the foundation. Uh, some of us in the Shivnada schools know that he's been part of, here he is, be part of uh, uh, something we did a few years ago and he came and coached and trained not only our teachers, but also our students. And let me tell you, he made an incredible impression. Uh, so welcome, uh, Dhananjaya. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Gopal, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, connect with all of you. Uh, I'm a big fan of the foundation, and uh, you know it's an absolute delight to just connect in times like this. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it's wonderful. Yeah. So you know, uh, obviously, the first question to everybody has always been, "How Sri Lanka coping? How are you coping? And uh, how's life been for you?" So Sri Lanka has had a very kind of a rapid response to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, I think we're doing fairly well, uh, you know, compared to some of the other countries uh, that are there. But still, it's a very terrifying experience. Uh, I think uh, both as a country and as professionals, uh, you know, across different spheres, everybody's worried. So it's it's a uh, it's a very trying time. But also, it's also very exciting because. Um, you know, the whole world is about to restart. Uh, you know, I was. Uh, soon as the epidemic broke, you know, it's a very funny story, but as soon as the epidemic broke, uh, the municipality uh, in our local area started to ration out foods. Uh, so, you know, it's so ironic. There's a group of, uh, you know, people down my lane. So we got a, you know, very wealthy business owner who lives up front. Then you got my house. And then we got a few uh, underprivileged daily workers living, you know, uh, down, down the lane. So all of us, you know, irrespective of where we came from, what we did, we're all lining up to, to, to take our daily rations. And it doesn't really matter how much money you had. You've got the same rations as everybody else. It's a very humbling experience. And then, you know, I put up a post on my Facebook saying that coronavirus has been a great level. You know, we've been humble. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's time for us to reflect on what's really important in life. Um, you know, and no better time to do it than now. <laughs> Sure, I'm sure our viewers, uh, some of them may have seen the video and uh, the absolutely phenomenal speech that you gave in the Toastmaster, which won you yes. this great honor uh, and maybe even changed your life. But uh, just wondering whether, uh, you know, the early struggles that you went through and uh, how you got there. Some of us had the privilege to really hear the story, but uh, do let us know and let our viewers know. Uh, about the early days and uh, how did you get into this public speaking and how did that whole incredible journey for you start? Yeah. So I, I think three things, right? I think throughout my journey, uh, you know, uh, if I look back at my journey and, and focus on the three big things that I've learned and hopefully it will be important to everybody listening in, is that it's a constant story of reinvention and uh, discovery of what you're good at. Um, you know, I've never, I've never been a public speaker when I was in school. Uh, you know, I was far from it. I was a very average student. Uh, and, uh, you know, after my 12th standard, my dad uh, took me to a Toastmasters club, a Toastmasters program. And it's there that I was first uh, uh, 
compelled to speak. And, and, and that's when I really discovered, you know, that I got, uh, got this ability uh, of the gap, gift of the gap. And then more importantly, I found the right mentors that could, you know, really harness that gift and make it something better. So, you know, I think one of the ways that I got through the trials and tribulations of my life is, you know, constantly reinventing what I'm doing and, and trying to discover new strengths that I've had, uh, you know, throughout my journey. The other thing is about, you know, who you, who you kind of surround yourself with. If you look at uh, the speech, I see something in you. Uh, and my whole life story is, is discussed in that, you know, from every stage, from an average student to kind of being lost in my uh, early adult life to discovering public speaking and making a profession, all of these, were, these things were possible because of the different people that I was fortunate to associate. I'm a firm believer that there may be a certain section of people that can discover their core talents. Um, but there are some, I think, majority uh, don't even know that they're gifted and it takes a keen eye a keen eye of a mentor or a coach or, a, a, you know, a parent uh, to spot that talent and groom it. So the second thing that, you know, helped me get over my life uh, files were the people that I associated. Um, you know, of course, the third thing was uh, just, uh, you know, identifying, uh, you know, the best uh, possible time to peak. I talk about this in uh, a lot of my uh, lectures and different people peak at different times. And I was a late bloomer. Uh, and fortunately, my parents were okay with that. Yeah, I, I had a cool dad. Uh, I, I, now I'm a dad. I got three kids and I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere as cool as my dad. But my parents were very, very relaxed. Uh, they weren't in a hurry. Uh, you know, and what they did for me and my brother was they said, listen, focus on your values. Um, you know, focus on your qualities. Uh, do what is right. Uh, you know, and then success will come. And so me and my brother, uh, you know, I have one brother at ample time to discover our skills and, and blossom at the right time. And so those three traits helped me, uh, helped me go from a pretty average individual to where I am today. Tell, tell us a little bit about your mom and dad, because I remember in the, in the, in the talk, you talked about how many of yeah. you have a cool dad and put all of yeah, them yeah, together yeah. and have my dad. Yeah. And yeah. same thing with your mom. Very yeah. Right, right. I, I think parents, um, you know, I think some parents might be here as well. I think uh, parents have a very, uh, a very uh, big imprint on how kids go about doing their life. So my, uh, though I never uh, acknowledge that the start, I look back and I look at the decisions that I've made in my life and the role models that I've uh, emulated are my parents. My dad is, is, is a career, career driven, uh, very uh, humble and strong professional. He was, uh, he was in the corporate sector. And my mom, uh, who started out in the corporate sector, became an entrepreneur. So, uh, you know, and, and, and when I decided to quit my nine to five job and, and go out on my own, uh, you know, my mom really understood what it was all about. And my dad also supported me. So I think you know, uh, from, from, from a kid's perspective, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to witness what a career would look like until retirement and then what entrepreneurship would look like until it's fusion. So that really helped me mold, uh, mold my path forward. So, you know, my mom and dad had a great influence in my life. You also, I remember mentioned about this mentor who pushed you. And even when we were sort of stepping back, he pushed you. Yeah. Yeah, tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. So, um, so I was 19 when I when I entered uh, uh, Toastmasters Club. Uh, I had uh, you know a very very abysmal track record at school, and uh, there was this chap called Arunasalam Balraj who had a vision for Toastmasters. And this was you know this was way back in 2007, that Toastmasters in Southeast Asia wasn't very big. Now Balraj's vision was to grow the movement in Asia and in Southeast Asia. So I, I just walked in that day. And, and, and he saw me and, and he wanted me to do a speech and I did it. And then he knew that, uh, you know, this is a talent that could win the world championship. But we were nowhere close to producing a world champion from Asia. We were very far away. And the contest had been a contest that's been there for 100 years, right? And then very uh, hardly an Asian had, had won it before. So we started the journey, me and Balraj together, uh, you know, and, and every year when I woke up, you know, my, the last thing I wanted to do was take part in the world championship, right? I wanted to quit. Uh, and, and this is the, this is the reality of life, right? You know, you only in the movies, do you find heroes who don't want to quit in real life? Heroes want to quit every day. You wake up in the morning and you're like, dude, I don't want to do this. Uh, but every time I wanted to quit my saving grace was there was a few people in my life I couldn't say no to. 
But it's a very important point, a very important trait to have. If you could say no to anybody, uh, then uh, your life is going to be very tough. Uh, but if you have a few people that you respect and that you can't say no to, uh, then you have a saving grace. So my saving grace was I couldn't say no to my parents. I couldn't say no to my mentor. And I, I just did it because I just couldn't say no. And, and that got me there. 2000, uh, I talk about this in my keynote, 2014, when I won the world championship, uh, you know, I, um, you know I, I was very confident that I didn't want to take part. And the only reason that I won was uh, was because I couldn't say no to Bauer. So uh, he's uh, he's an amazing individual. He became the uh, president of Toastmasters International. grew the grew the movement from three to four clubs in Asia to you know three thousand uh, clubs across Asia. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very powerful uh, powerful uh, thing to have a great mentor who looks out for you. You know the. The journey to the Toastmaster and the speech, while some of us had the privilege to see, we are about more than five, six hundred people logged in. I think questions will start coming in. Uh, I know most actors must be hating this when people say, do a little bit of that Shole movie, <laughs> and that, you know, little, little bit that you acted there. But I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Do you think you could do a little bit of little bit of that? I know you need standing space and moving around. But... Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I could I could do that one line. That, so, uh, so that the others are not tempted to go on uh, on YouTube and see that phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think you should get on that uh, get on that YouTube and uh, you know go to this uh, part where I talk about my mom, uh, and I say you know moms cry three types of tears: uh, tears of joy, uh, tears of shame. Uh, and tears of sadness, right? and, and, and yeah, that, that line, yeah, that 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 line was uh, was a hitter for me. Uh, it's it's a beautiful speech. Uh, it's been viewed over five million times, but more than anything, it's very very reminiscent of the truth. And I think as speakers, as educators, uh, we need to kind of any. What I've noticed in my career is any type of material that's close to the truth gets caught on very fast. And, and the truth about the speech of I see something in you is it's okay if you don't know what makes you special. Long as you surround yourself with people that, uh, that value you, you can discover that special something. So go definitely check the speech out. Uh, it'll definitely put a smile uh, during these tough times in the first. Well, then let's go straight to the, to the event in itself. I remember you mentioned that you failed a couple of times earlier, a couple of years. And you were all ready to give up. But how did it feel going there to America and doing the doing the speech? Were you nervous? Uh, were you confident? Yeah, I, I, I was very nervous. I was very nervous. I knew it was, uh, you know, this moment wasn't going to come again um, because it's a grueling journey. It was a 10-year journey to, uh, because we're, we're not native English speakers, right? I mean, this, English is not our first language. Yeah. Uh, it took a long time to nail that down, long time to understand the art of telling a story. Uh, you know, it takes a huge time to just know how to connect with a, a, a global audience. Right? I mean, you know, when you go to the World Championship, you've got people from, uh, you know, four corners of the globe and they interpret what you say in, in, in as much different ways as their nationalities. So, um, you know, it, it, it takes a profound amount of effort to kind of focus and then lock it down. It took 10 years for me to get there. And, and on the journey and after getting there, I learned three very important things that even, you know, post-world championship. And one thing is that, you know, after you take away the 10% that's different, um, you know, your race, color, skin, you know, all of that stuff, uh, you know, we are all the same. I've spoken in five different continents around the world, uh, you know, and, and every time, Everybody had the same, the same dreams, uh, same uh, fears in life, and, and you know, this amazing opportunity to just uh, uh, understand that all of humanity is the same. Uh, you know, the second thing that I discovered was fear is a very important thing to have. I think fear is the uh, is actually the foundation of performance. Uh, if you're not afraid, uh, you know, you're not moving. And uh, you know, I think that fear of mediocrity is what kind of propelled me across. Uh, you know, most of my journey. So uh, what I always say when people come and ask me, how do I get out, get, get through the fear of public speaking? I said, don't focus on the fear. Don't focus on taking away the fear. Try to use that fear to be something better than what you are today. And of course, the final thing is, uh, you know, when you win the world championship, you also be, and, and everything you say, you know, people tend to believe it and you got to be very responsible in what you say. 
uh, you know, and then that's something that I've learned to be very mindful about. Yeah. You know, I had a few more questions, but let me jump into some of the audience questions that we have. Right. Um, what, according to you, are the top three things one needs to adopt to become an effective speaker? I think clarity. Clarity is very important. You got to be absolutely clear about what you're saying. Uh, you know, and, and the second thing is about context and what's what, how you're going to make that clarity using context is the audience changes depending on where you speak, what organization you speak to. And number three is how close that is to the truth, right? I mean, if you, if you are a professional, and I always say this, you may be talking about leadership, you might be talking about project management. Do you believe it to be the truth? Because if you know it's the truth, then you don't have to be afraid to uh, say it. So it's clarity, context, and the truth is uh, what I always say a great speaker needs to have. Clarity, context, and truth. Yeah. Since we are an educational institution, these are great lessons for us. So I've got, the, I've got those down and we'll share that also for those who are not here. Um, okay, let's go to one more question. What is the most important thing in life as, as per your experience? And how do you deal with critical tasks? So the most important thing in life for me is, um, you know, reinvention. I think reinvention is, is the ultimate. The whole, whole world uh, is trying to do that now. Yeah. I, I mean, make no mistake, right? I mean, if you, if, you know, uh, most of us, most of us are going to be flattened by this virus. I mean, we'll, we, will, we will, most of us will lose everything. Some of us will lose everything, right? Uh, you know, from jobs to savings, uh, you know, it's, it's a bad space to be in. But, you know, I always believe is when you lose everything is when you can have anything, right? When you become a nobody, you can become an anybody, right? So uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I, what I always say in my life is the very fear that you have right now is, is what you need to let go and embrace and, and reinvent yourself. And there's no better time to do it than now because everything you have or had or thought you had has been taken away and will be taken away. So it's, it's a great time to build a different world uh, and reinvent something better, even if it's for a short time, uh, something closer to the truth and something closer to uh, something more sustainable. I thought nobody is going to be inspiring in this current situation. But one, you said fear is a good thing. Secondly, reinvent yourself. And uh, just just go forward from there. So probably uh, very apt for all of us in these incredibly difficult times, you know. Yeah. But uh, do you also believe that there's some cosmic uh, message out here to the to na from nature, and why is this yeah, sort of yeah. happening? Well, one hundred percent. You know, I, I think uh, you know a lot of lot of people are, are trying to figure out the why. But I think what we need to figure out is what type of a world we need to build uh, post COVID-19, right? I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing how the things you thought was important could be taken away from you so soon, right? Uh, you know, today in Sri Lanka, you don't have the luxury of ordering a, a ice cafe latte or a cafe mocha or, you know, whatever. You know, all of the things you thought you could live without, you know, we are now down to living without it, right? And when you really look at it, the only two things you need is food and love, right? And if you have food and love, uh, you know, you can do absolutely anything. And that's, that's what's available right now, right? So, so my, my advice is, you know, look around you. Uh, you know, if, if you're well-to-do, feed the people around you. And then more than anything, just, just give your love. And then these two things are, for me, COVID-19 has made it absolutely clear that these are the only two things that you need. Uh, to live a happy life. It's wonderful. Fear and love, uh, love and uh, food. and food. Yeah. Probably that's what we uh, what we had as hunter gatherers five seven thousand yeah. years ago. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, man. I mean, it's it's, it's amazing. Uh, I I was just talking to my wife today, and and you know, it's 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 such an amazing time to just be a dad. Right. So, you know, I, I, and you suddenly realize that, uh, you know, uh, eventually the kids, I got three kids, one is six, my twins are four years old. Uh, you know, they don't care about COVID-19. They, they don't, they don't understand what it is. They're happy to have their parents at home. 
uh, you know, and you realize your job can actually happen while staying from home. <laughs> so, so, so it's it, it's a fantastic time for the truth to come out and uh, and realize what's important for us. You know, I, I'm going to just uh, sort of uh, all the people who have not really seen you before or heard you before, just to sort of uh, tempt them to get back and watch that video. I'm going to a little quote on your on your website. I'm going to quote right. from. Uh, what I read on the website again, one of the biggest fears we have in life is becoming poor. When you start the game at the bottom, you know how to stretch a dollar to the last. Once you get to the top, you ain't afraid to fail because you know that if you lose everything, you can still make it with a dollar a day. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you put that up? And when did you put that up? Yeah, this, this was some time ago, and it took me hey, back to the journey. It's not post COVID. It's not post COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it took me. It, 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 it's, it's before COVID, and it took me back to my entrepreneur journey. You know, when when an entrepreneur starts out, and I'm sure everybody on this call could could relate to this. Is we learn how to stretch a uh, hundred rupees, right? I mean, you learn how to stretch a thousand rupees the last you know a week, a month, uh, and what happens is when you become successful in life, and when you have you know, you know, any amount of money that you want, you know, deep down inside, you can still live off thousand rupees a week or a month, right? So um, don't be, the, the message of that is, is no matter how successful you become, don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to lose everything and start over again to ch chase that, that success that you need because you know you can make it with what you have. Uh, and that's one of my messages because a lot of people, what happens is they start off they get everything that you want uh, in life and then this whole fear starts to set in and they're afraid to lose what they have and when you're afraid to lose what you have that's when your downfall starts to happen so don't be afraid to lose what you have constantly keep reinventing and learn how to stretch that uh, you know thousand rupee nose to last a week last a month okay there are several questions popping up here but you know just tell us about your life post uh the world championship and being the winner and what all have you been doing? So, so for me, my job has, uh, has, my job has been about traveling. Uh, so, so before post COVID, I've, uh, you know, speaking in different five, five different continents. Uh, and my, my passion is to teach people about, you know, uh, how to tell a great story. Uh, stories shape our culture, uh, stories shape what we believe in. Uh, and I, I was always fascinated about telling stories. And you know, that led into helping leaders you know, communicate more clearly uh, and helping leaders perform uh, more consistently uh, and helping people understand how do you identify a talent and grow the talent. So, so my job revolves around traveling and teaching people these things uh, you know, in different parts of the world. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of what I've been up to. I was in China for uh, uh, you know, last year for about a month, traveling yeah. to different cities. No, 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 Wuhan, no, Wuhan, but some amazing cities. I've never been to China, um, you know, and then it, it blew my mind. I, I was, I was thinking, I was in my mind, I was thinking, hey, is it going to be like New York? Is it going to be like Los Angeles? You know, you, you can't prepare your mind to figure out what Beijing looks like, uh, you know, in, in your mind. So it, it, all of these countries have opened my eyes and then I've been happy to travel around and impart my knowledge to different, uh, different types of people around the world. That's what I do. You know, we're going to oscillate between uh, what I have in mind uh, to ask you and also the questions from the audience so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Richa Agarwal is asking, how can you transform from being a close person to an open person? Right. Um, you know, once again, I think you got you to gotta fundamentally uh, figure out that assumption. I'm a close person. I'm very close, right? Uh, you know, I'm actually an introvert. Um, and I only become an extrovert when I get on stage. That's about the only time, you know, you could lock me up with a room with a couple of books and I, I won't come out for, uh, for a week, right? But, but it, it, you know, it's, it's like, it's like um, finding your passion. When you find your passion, you open up. It could be playing a violin, it could be dance, it could be uh, drumming, or it could be speaking. When you find your passion and how to express it, that's when you really open up, right? So, um, so don't, there's no concrete way to say, hey, here's what you need to open up. My, my, uh, my advice to you is find your passion and then you will find the location and the circumstances to express yourself and you will, you know, you'll be fantastic. You'll be uh, amazing when that happens. Brilliant. 
Um, you know, I'm 60. I'm still learning, so I've been writing all the things that you've been saying. Yeah. Use it again. For as many years I've left. Okay. Um, Mahad Jain says public speakers are usually great negotiators in personal life. What is the secret? I mean, the ones you're negotiating with your wife, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so the secret is basically, uh, you know, your the mind to muscle connection. Right. I mean, because we speak eight hours of the day, uh, you know, we can speak as fast as our thoughts can form. Right. And, and that's the key. So when you practice something, and this is this is not something that's different to anybody else. I mean, from a footballer to a to to athlete to who a mathematician, uh, you know, because we do it so much, uh, we are we are able to quickly get out uh, what our thoughts and our, our mind, what, the logical structure of sentences. We're able to get it out really fast, and that gives us a little bit of a competitive advantage when it comes to negotiations. So, so that's the real secret. Okay, uh, you did about books, but uh, which is your favorite book, and who's your who's your most admired speaker? Right. So, my favorite book, I think, I think a book that changed my life. Uh, I always quote this book uh, was The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. It's a book that I constantly go back to and read. Uh, you know, even today. Uh, I love it because every time you read it, you get a different, uh, different perspective. Uh, it's a story of reinvention. It's sort of discovery. Um, so grab it, read it. That's, that's going to be uh, my recommendation to you. Um, you know, my favorite speaker, um, I, I think I got different speakers that I love for different reasons. I don't have one particular, uh, particular reader. Uh, if you are a speaker that loves, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the debating style uh, of speaking, I would say Christopher Hitchens was the best. Um, you know, he wrote a lovely book called God is Not Great. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a controversial book. But if you see him speak on YouTube, uh, you know, you'd, you'd really admire his finesse. I love Les Brown for emotion and storytelling. He's, he's a fantastic speaker. He, he's able to grab and keep the audience in the palm of your hand. Um, you know, and those two, those two are like my, uh, my, my favorite. Uh, well, I've got a few more, but those two stand out. Okay, um, Ananda Raman wants to know how do you effectively utilize your time during the lockdown and tell us about your personal routine. Right, um, so I'm not in a hurry to utilize my time. <laughs> so uh, what I do is I go through this creative process, right? And then once again, this is, you know, we, we've got so much of uh, uh, books out there that tell you how to, how to structure your time. It's a, such a personal thing. So what I do is I, uh, you know, when my creative process starts with sleeping, I, I sleep about, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, and, and, and while I'm sleeping, I'm constantly thinking about what's the next piece of art I want to create, right? So I wake up, uh, I do a little bit of dabbling, I go back to sleep, I read a book. And then and after about 16 hours of doing nothing, boom, uh, I get that brilliant idea. Then I start working for the next 20 hours, uh, you know, to get that onto a piece of paper or a video or a concept. And then I go back to sleep again. So that's how uh, that's how my creative process works. And Saurav Pramanik wants to know that I found my passion, but I'm dependent on the pay at the end of the month. So how do I overcome that? <clears throat> no, no, that, that, that's a very good question. Man. Uh, you know, I think uh, you need to be able to balance your responsibilities with your passion as well. But the good thing about a passion is if you try uh, really smart, not hard, but if you try really smart, uh, you can convert your passion into money. Uh, so, what parents and, and society at large, there are many avenues to convert your passion into money. So, as soon as I found my passion, by profession, I'm an HR professional. That was my job. Uh, but speaking, uh, you know, was something that I did on the side. It was my passion. So, whenever I had free time, I used to go and speak in universities. I got to go and speak in schools. And this is you know, off work hours, right? And I think it's a very interesting story. Uh, so one day I went to speak at a school uh, and so one of the parents were there, uh, you know, and, and it was a free gig. It was absolutely free. But, but I did it with so much passion. The parents were really wowed by it. So this guy who was a dad of one of the students came up to me and said, look, I got a company. Uh, you know, I'd love for you to come and talk with my uh, staff. It was a small company, about 13 people. You know, and, and he paid me for it. Right. So, uh, you know, that's how you connect the dots. You try to do your passion as consistently as possible, create the visibility to yourself and somebody will be there who will come up to you and say, listen, I'm willing to pay you X number of you know, dollars or money to, to do this. Um, so it's about getting yourself out there, 
showcase your passion. Somebody will see it and, and there will be someone who will be willing to pay for it if it is something that's great. You know, I met Virinder Sevag the other day. I asked him a question. I've always wanted to ask a top level cricketer that, you know, right. is there a bit about talent at the highest level which can be uh, taught? Can everything be taught? Can you really train to be a great cricketer or is it some sort of thing is inborn? Right. Uh, so here's the same question from uh, someone who's asking, uh, is it is public speaking something that can be taught or is it like you're born with it? Right. Uh, so let, let me leave this. If it can be taught, then obviously the follow-up would be, how do you do that? What are the skills? Right. How, how right. do you work at that? Right. right. So let me ask that question because it's a very important question. But I'll start with this premise, right? Hard work always wins when talent doesn't work hard, right? So that is a very important quotation. Uh, so y you might not have a single talent, but you could beat someone with a talent if you work hard. Uh, that is a fundamental truth. But if you have a talent and you work hard, it'll be easier for you. So how do you know whether you have a talent? There's three things, right? And I call this, uh, you know, the three-prong test. Number one, if you have a talent, number one, no, you know. Dan, can you right? hear me? Just okay. like, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we lost you for a bit. Now you're okay. Now okay. You're Okay, okay, great. So there are three things to know whether you, if you have a talent. Number one, it comes easy. For example, if you're a dancer, it comes easily to you. If you're a speaker, it comes easily to you. If you're a mathematician, it comes easily to you. If you have a talent, that thing comes easily to you, right? You don't have to put a lot of effort. Number two, no matter how much you do it, you never get sick of it, right? And that's when you know you've got a real talent because you don't get tired of doing it. Number three, you can teach it to somebody else in detail. So if you, if you, have something in your life that falls into these three things, uh, that's, that's the start of you identifying your talent, right? But you might not have it. It's okay. But if you work hard, you can convert anything that fits into that mold of talent. So that's probably my answer to that, Gopal. Okay. Um, this is a question I think we've all wanted to ask you. Jennifer wants to know, when are you going to start writing books? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think I, I, I think probably when I have something meaningful to say, right? I think I get I get that question a lot, and I say that's my answer. I just you know I think my, I'm on my own journey. I think uh, I I've got a lot to grow myself, uh, and uh, you know I think when I find something meaningful, which won't be very different from what many of the people who, who discovered the truth have to say, I'll probably be able to give it my own perspective. So I got a, I got a little bit more to go uh, to get there. Dan, let me tell you, as, a, as fans, uh, don't wait for too long. Start start writing that yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Really I know. Short, I'll take, I'll I think take that you said that you can make it into a book and make it really short, but <laughs> uh, it'll be great. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things we learned from the conversation with you when you came here to Shivnada Foundation and to the Shivnada schools is that yeah. Dan is not just a fantastic public speaker, but he's an amazing human being. And I think that's what resonates with us and uh, with, with the qualities that you carry into, into your speaking and your training. And we benefited a great deal. So write that book. I will, I will definitely do that, Gopal. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sumit Gupta wants to know, being a motivational speaker, do you encounter low phases in your life? And if you do, how do you overcome that? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, um, any, any type of perform, I'm, I'm just going to come out of, I'm just going to come out of uh, motivational speaking because, you know, speaking is a performance, just like if you're an artist, a a any performer has to have a large degree of empathy, right? Um, empathy is what helps you connect with an audience, irrespective of what, what your craft is. And, and when you have a lot of empathy, you're also very sensitive to what happens to you, what happens to people around you. And, and believe me, I have more lows than highs in my life. I mean, 100%, right? Um, you know, but, but what I do, once again, I come back to this, is that I have, you know, different people in my life that I depend on to give me the right perspective. And that's what you need when you go through a low in your life is to have the right perspective because your mind will start to weave a story that is not true and you will start to believe it. And that kind of cascades into something else. And before you know it, you've, you've dug yourself into a hole that you can't get out of. But when you have a group of people that are able to give you a perspective on what you're thinking, 
you've got a slight chance to contradict yourself and try to see the truth in your situation. So, so my, my answer to that is yes, I go through lows, but then I go and get the right perspective. And um, th that's how I dig myself out of it. Okay. Um, I hope all the leaders of the world right now have got right advisors because they're going through a phase which one human yeah. mind can't quite fathom. If they have 50, 20 great brains or maybe 30, 40 great brains around them, uh, probably probably they'll they'll do fine by their country. Okay, Devang Patel wants to know, sometimes giving a closure to a conversation is very important. Being a Toastmaster myself, sometimes I find it challenging during the impromptu sessions. How do you come up with on-spot closures? Sorry, Gopal, I lost you right there. Okay. Devang Patel, he wants to know, sometimes giving a closure to a conversation is very important. Yeah. Being a Toastmaster myself, sometimes I find it challenging during the impromptu sessions. How do you come up with on-spot closures? And I don't know what on-spot okay. closures are. No, 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 I get what you mean. No, um, the you know. best, way to, best way to close a, close a speech or a conversation is to be brief. Uh, sometimes when you do impromptu speaking, you try to over explain something, feeling that you have not communicated clearly to the audience. So um, how you close something is my favorite way is to just keep it brief and close with a powerful statement. And uh, I think that's the best way to go. And I see a lot of speakers struggle because, you know, they, they speak impromptuly and then they start to over explain something, feeling that they have not connected or explained something to the audience. So keep it brief, have a couple of powerful statements and make a big, bold, brash statement and then close your close your conversation or impromptu speech. How did you close the Toastmaster 2014? I see something in you. Yeah, I said I see something in you and threw a rose to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. It's such a brilliant yeah. speech. Okay, we are coming towards the end of uh, this amazing session with Dananjay Hedrachi, Toastmaster 2014 winner and a motivational speaker, corporate a trainer and life coach. So I'm going to leave the last three, four minutes to you, Dan. You can also give us a message at the Shibnado Foundation. We look forward to seeing you when things get back to normal. Uh, we definitely look yep. forward to seeing you at the university. I'm sure a lot of people will be now looking forward to being part of maybe a session for the MBA students or maybe two for everybody. But uh, three minutes, four minutes, uh, Dan, all yours. Thank you so much, yep. but I leave it to you. We lost your sound. Thank you, Gopal. I, yeah. It's an uh, absolute yeah. pleasure to be with you. And, and you know, in, in parting, my, uh, my message would be to kind of constantly reinvent yourself. Uh, you know, this time period we're going through is, uh, you know, is, 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 is going to be a tough time. But when you come out of it, they'll have a lot of stories to say and a lot of stories to share. And, uh, you know, let's, let's make something new. Let's change, change the narrative, change the story, and uh, build a better, beautiful world. You made it sharp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dhananth Jaya. As Mr. Nader said when he met you, don't call him Dan. His name is Dhananth Jaya. It's such a lovely name. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, from all of us at the Shibnada Foundation. Greatly appreciate this. This was short notice. Thank you so much, Dananjay. And thank you, audience. You've been fantastic. There were more than 600, 700 thank people. You. We'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.